So I'm going to present on migration, income pooling, as well as food deprivation. Um, so I think we were all familiar with the context that um, migration is the defining feature of our century. Um, along with it, we, we have got families or households getting spatially displaced. So we've got households at origin and then we've got the migrant households, seemingly giving us two sets of households that are dependent on each other. Um, technology is on the rise, meaning that these households are now able to maintain and share decision making across distance as if they were together. Right? So this background is now standing against quite a number of economic approaches. Right? The, the first one being that economists traditionally view a household as an independent separate unit which does not in any way relate to the other. So it emphasizes on co-residence as well as eating from the same pot to define a, a household, right? So as a result, the households model that have been developed up to date, they don't take care of this spatial dimension. Also, the interdependency is underplayed and finally, the remittances are still not incorporated in the income of these models. Uh, the second one, second approach is, is on income pooling, and I may have to, to define how I use income pooling in this context. So if household consumption is independent of who brings money into the household, then we have income pooling. In other words, the expenditure outcomes will be the same in spite of who receives the money. So that's how I use income pooling. I don't use income pooling in the sense of economic psychology where, let's say, a man and a woman would bring money into the same account or into the same pot. I am interested in the expenditure outcomes of that money. For instance, if a man is to receive $100 and then they are at liberty to use it for the household or for themselves, so we see those expenditure outcomes. The same as for a woman, if we take that 100 from a man and we give it to a woman, then we say, will the expenditure outcomes be the same? If the, out if the answer is yes, so we have income pooling. So you can tell that income pooling is a stringent approach in that in a household where people live together within the same roof, their expenditure outcomes can definitely differ. Right? So economists have been studying income pooling in the same household, but I'm extending this uh, research to now study income pooling in what I would call geographically uh, separate households, right? which are dependent. Right? So it's geographically stretched households. So we want to see if the income of the migrant that comes to this house in terms of remittance is used in the same way as the income of the household of origin. So that will be my income pooling in this instance. So the formal models are especially led by Becker, who believes in the unitary household model, which equates to income pooling. Then we've got alternative models that have been coming up, like the collective household models, which actually do not equate a household into an income pooling unit. So this paper, I've already mentioned a bit what I'm doing, but I think I'll emphasize that um, on top of creating this geographically stretched household model, I provide its 
testable empirical as well as policy implications. And then I use those implications, uh, I use the data from Zimbabwe Bulawayo to, to, to test the implications. In essence, I'll look at the determinants of remittances. I'll look at income pooling from the migrants' remittances as well as income generated at household of origin. And then finally, I look at the impact of migration at the household of origin in the context of food deprivation. So I wouldn't want to dwell much on this, but um, what I try to do is to extend the model by Becker, which was extended as well by Singh, to include the component of the migrant household. So to do this, I maximize the utility of this household, which I think has this component of consumption of purchased goods from the market, self-produced activities or self-produced goods, and then finally the stock of time that the household spend together. So I maximize that subject to an income constraint that I model after a household member has migrated. So with that, I find that um, the model gives almost the same uh, outcome as the other economic theories. But what it goes on to do, it now gives us the household income at origin, which will be different than it would have been if it did not have a household a migrant. So, in short, that is the, 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 the model that I try to build. Then what are the implications derived from, 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 from that model? The first one, I think which is a bit common to us all, is that the household with a migrant is expected to have higher income exposed to mitigate food deprivation, right? And that's what I would want to test. There are two falsifiable conditions that emanate from, from, from the model. The first one is that the migrants must be remitting. Definitely without a remittance, I see a situation whereby the household at origin will be worse off compared to a situation if it did not have a migrant household. Households would have lost labor, right, to most of the households in this context of Zimbabwe. They would sell an asset, at times a cow or something, to make sure that a particular person goes abroad so that they remit. So if this labor is lost and then there is no remittances, this household may actually be worse off. Then the second one, is that the remittances must actually be used for the benefit of those left behind. Now, what do I mean by that? Some migrants send money to build their mansions, their houses, which does not, at times, benefit the household of origin in terms of getting food, right, or securing their, their food. So that's the, the, the other condition. Then the, the social policy uh, implication is that a blanket social policy that excludes migrant households from social assistance may be prejudiced in that. If it's true that some migrants don't, mi uh, don't remit, then a policy like Stephen Deverud, they prove in Zimbabwe that NGOs would ask a particular household to say, do you have a migrant or not? If the answer is yes, then this household does not receive social assistance. Right? So should we have such a blanket social policy that just says if a household is a migrant, then it's better off, then it may be prejudiced because some households do not necessarily receive remittances, as I will show later. Then the last one does not necessarily relate to what I'm presenting, so I would skip it. Let me then quickly uh, get to our data. So we collected data in 
Zimbabwe on 300 households. So this data is structured as follows. I, I think what's important for me to quickly talk about is the fact that, um, sorry, uh, is the fact that migrant households, like a household with a lot of migrants, those households with migrants have got less self-production activities. Then the lower the number of migrants, the higher the number of self-productive activities, which in a way, just from a pictorial point of view, demonstrate the entrepreneurial shield that may take place uh, in, in the households, which may stop labor migrating. Uh, then I look at the household characteristics the, the households with migrants, they have a lower wage at origin compared to the households without migrants. Yet the households with migrants have consumption that is almost the same as that without migrants. I see households with migrants managing to reduce food deprivation and this is significantly different from households without migrants, just at descriptive uh, levels. I then look at the individual characteristics of the migrants. Slightly below half, they remit both cash and non-cash remittances. There are more females in migration than males, and most of them are actually in South Africa. So, the first thing that I try to establish is the determinants of remittances. Um, I use a logistic regression model to, to do that, and then, sorry the figures may not appear, but what I see most, if I look at the full model, by full model I'm combining the local migrants as well as the international migrants. Migrant age, I see it matters right across my full model as well as my restricted models where I look at migrants within Zimbabwe and migrants outside Zimbabwe. Education is also another factor as well as having a child at the household of origin. To my surprise, I thought that gender uh, would have been a, 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 a factor, but in this case it's not. And I think the, the, the presenter, Julie, when she presented earlier on, she also found the same result. So I was comforted a bit <laughs> where the, the remittance, you know, gender is not necessarily a, a factor in the context of Zimbabwe. So I like that finding. However, <laughs> however, I'm going to show later on uh, where gender seem to play a role on income pooling. So for income pooling, I look at the partial derivatives of money spent from remittances on particular sets of goods, like what I would call sustenance goods, where I look at cooking oil, etc., as well as clothing and education, and I compare to the partial derivative of the money at household of origin. If the two are equal, then we will claim that there is income pooling. Oh, all right. So these are the results. Uh, I'll try to now speed up by five minutes. So what I find from these results is that on frequent expenditures, females with children at the household of origin they pull their income together with that at the household of origin. Right? There are two implications for this result. The first one, it could be that females usually have a dedicated role of buying frequent uh, food types, um, uh, like cooking oil, etc. Yet men, they dwell a lot on clothing, etc., which is reflected this side as well. But that is very important in that if we are to look at food deprivation, then a migrant household with a female could particularly do better. I now split the sample into international migrants as well as local migrants. For international migrants, the results are the same as the previous slide. 
But for migrants within Zimbabwe, I see that all migrants pool their income, perhaps maybe of proximity. I go on to look at the impact of migration on food deprivation, and I use a switching regression model to, to do this. Right? With that, I find that migrant households become a bit better in terms of uh, they reduce food deprivation by 45 percentage points, and they do better than non-migrant households who, in their own right, without a migrant, they reduce uh, food deprivation by 8.9 percentage points. However, I see that non-migrant households would have done much better if they had a household, uh, if they had a migrant, such that they would be better compared to migrant households by 25 percentage points. So let me quickly conclude. I see three factors that matter for, my, uh, for remittances in Zimbabwe. That is the age, education, and having a child at the household of origin. Then the second thing that I see is that gender matters for pooling income on frequent and low-cost purchases that characterize food patterns of poor households. The third one is that on high value as well as infrequent purchases like education and clothing, men also seem to pool income with households of origin. Uh, I see a situation whereby if a household is a migrant who is not above 30 years, not educated, as well as not having a child at the household of origin, that household may actually be worse off compared to non-migrant households, to an extent that a social policy that is blanket may miss this point. And with that, I thank you.